Hi everyone, it's Professor Piper and today I want to talk about the writing process and how we work on it in college. So we're going to talk about the definition of the process and we're going to go into the various stages of the writing process. As we go through, we're going to learn how to brainstorm, organize, and, and go through all of these different steps to make sure that you have a really great paper. As we finish, we're even going to get into the reference pages and, and conclusions and all of these other things to make sure that you are confident in your writing process. This is the most important thing to learn in Comp 1. So let's get started. So process as a definition is the steps or stages one goes through in order to complete any task. And that means that everything that we do from the beginning all the way through the end goes through a type of process. When we look at the writing process, though, we also say that it's a recursive process. That means that it kind of goes back and forth. So I always kind of like look at it as trying to build a house. We start with this idea of the structure. We have an overall structure that we start thinking of the ideas and figuring out what we want to say. And then we kind of start filling in some of the details. And as we go into those details, we get further into the, the colors and the, the ideas and really the explanation and developing, fleshing out what we have to say. So as we are building our house, things kind of start coming together and you can see where things are going. And then as we look at the draft, we decide to make some changes. And sometimes those changes work out and sometimes they don't. We have to go back. So let's take another look at what another process might look like. Here is more of a, a structural look at it. And you can see here between the brainstorming, the organization, and then the rough draft and the revise and edit that it looks recursive. Things kind of go back and forth in a circle. And sooner or later, though, as you work through the process, you end up with a really great final draft. So let's start with stage one. What is brainstorming? So this is about free thinking ideas just related to the topic, whatever that has to do, you get an idea and in college, your professor won't necessarily give you the topic. Most of the time we kind of just give you a direction and guide you where you need to go. So you might end up coming with up the whole thing and there's different ways to do that. So let's take a look. One is a web and you might've seen things like this where you just kind of figure things out. It, it's very visual. So if we start with sports, we might do baseball and basketball, for instance. And then we start making connections between the various ideas. So from basketball, then we might go to the various stars, LeBron James versus Michael Jordan. We might look at the basketball rules and we can keep going on this. And what this does is help us visually break down what it is that we're trying to find out. Now, this doesn't mean that everything that we do is going to be in the paper, but it helps us give a really good direction. Another way to do brainstorming is to just start with an outline. And most college professors really like the formal outline structure. This means as we go through, we have the, the Roman numerals and the letters and the numbers and all those kind of things. And we'll take a look at that a little bit more closely in a minute. But these are one way to really start structuring your ideas where you can see the relationship between your ideas. Another way is just to do bullet points or even a list where you might just have some idea like politics itself. Well, if we go into politics, we might think about the president, Donald Trump. And then we might think about Congress and the Senate and the House. And we start developing different ideas. And if you look, you can kind of see how each of these ideas have main points and then some of those supporting ideas underneath it. Again, this brainstorming is just a way to start thinking of things that you might want to talk about. As you go through your brainstorming, whichever way you use, then you're going to find that you tend to gravitate towards certain ideas more than others. And that's where you go with your paper. All of these ideas are valid. All of these ideas are possible to be able to write on a different paper. But the ones that you feel that you have the best ideas about, that's where you really want to go for your specific papers. A couple other ideas, just so you know, there's free writing where you just sit down and start writing. You might start thinking about your day or something like that, but pretty soon as you start to write, then you're going to find that 
well, most of it doesn't work, there's going to be a few gems in there. You just got to find them. You might even draw. I have students who have doodled on papers and then pretty soon they start coming up with something just to get the mind thinking. You might even do post-it notes on the wall. I had a student one time who couldn't do all these other things. It just didn't work for him. And I gave him a stack of post-it notes and he was able to rearrange the different notes as he walked by or he went to class and came back and take another look. And then he rearranged the post-it notes and then finally could put something on paper. As a matter of fact, it still works. He's in graduate school now and he's about to graduate next spring. So that really kind of works. The point is, is to find something that works for you. Every person's brainstorming process is going to be different. So once you find something that works, go ahead and stick with it. Now we have to organize. We have to move from these general ideas from our brainstorming into a more logical order. Organization is really key in any type of writing. So we can look at that. And like I said earlier, many professors are going to require a formal outline, especially when we get into research papers like in Comp 2 or your higher level courses. Research is really key in college, so we want to make sure that you are organized. Here is an example of one kind of organization, this formal outline structure. And if you look in here, this actually shows the organization of a paper. So the, the first main ideas are Roman numeral under topic. We have an introduction. The first thing that you have in your introduction is a hook statement, the attention getter. Then you have the thesis statement. And it tells the reader what to expect and all of these things. But as we go through the outline, if you kind of take a look and follow through, you can see how each main idea has supportive statements. This is one way to really clarify where you're going. When you get into research, then you can even add in various sources that you use to support your, your ideas. And this helps you give like a roadmap to your, your paper. There's no way to do writer's block. You can't forget what you're going to do because you have a roadmap. You, you always know where you're going to stop, where you can pause if you got to take a break or, or even just go to class and then come back to it. You always know what the next idea is because the organization allows you to do so. So there's no way to get lost in a paper that you have outlined appropriately. As we continue with organization, let's kind of break down what those parts of a paper actually are. So let's first start with a title. That title is priceless. And so in kind of an illustration here, I want you to take a look. This is a link that I had on my own Facebook feed. I love social media and especially I was thinking about how to explain it. And I wanted to talk about what makes us really click on a title. So a good title is what we call clickable. It's something that's interesting. It's relevant to something that you want to know about. It is something that's kind of brief. We don't want to have super long titles, especially for something like a clickable title. But that doesn't mean it has to be one word. You can have several words as you have here. Don't help kids with your, their homework. And as a parent myself, I'm thinking, whoa, that's got to be interesting. And in fact, it actually really was a, a good essay. But as we look, it's also very descriptive. So a title needs to be representative of your paper. Now, that means that there are some bad titles out there. So let's take a look at what not to do. A good title doesn't have a spoiler. That means you're not giving too much inf information away. So here is something that might work. Uh, the similarities and differences between apples and oranges. And that is so boring. You're giving way too much away to your reader. And even though it's kind of a silly title, it kind of gives the, the example of a spoiler. We also don't like cliches in our title because cliches are so overdone. It's just kind of something that's been regurgitated over and over. And I am not a writer is a little too quirky, too cliche-ish to be interesting for an academic paper. Now, generic is one of the most huge dangers, to tell the truth. A lot of students will have very generic papers, like descriptive paper. Well, who really cares? Nobody wants to read something called descriptive paper. Anything like that is just going to be boring from the beginning. The worst that I've ever seen, though, check it out, Piper's paper. Please do not 
title your paper, Piper's Paper. Nobody wants to read that, including Professor Piper. Now, a hook statement is going to catch your reader's attention. This is something that really makes your reader just want to dive into your essay. That hook statement is the first part of your introduction. And this is what we say when we're hooking the reader in. It gets the attention. If the, if the title is going to help you click on something, then the hook statement's going to reel them in and make them want to read. So here's a couple examples. A definition hook statement. Many consider the claims made by our current politicians as alternate facts, but others proclaim that making intentional false statements is lying. So the definition gives the idea of lying and what an alternate fact is, and you're really defining something for a reader, but you're telling them, hey, this is going to be really good. Let's talk about it. So another one is like a little known fact. Only female mosquitoes actually bite. If you're going to do a, like a biology paper or something like this, this would be something that would be kind of a quirky thing to, to get somebody's attention. It's something that you may not already know. So this is something that little known facts kind of get people involved into the paper. Another one is an anecdote or a story. So over fall break, we treated our nephews to a family adventure at a local corn maze. And actually, this was a real story. Uh, we did take our nephews to the corn maze, and it was a great adventure. So if I was writing this essay, then it would be something that I was going to tell a story. So a hook statement allows you to get your reader involved. Now, an opinion that you might want to challenge or that you might think the reader might want to challenge is going to be interesting as well. College students often believe that the best writers are able to write good essays in little time. Well, as a professor, I can tell you that nobody writes a really good essay super fast. So even if they say they do, they're lying. But that's an opinion that your reader could challenge, and that might be something to hook them in and really get them involved in what you have to say. Then you have a thesis statement. A thesis statement can be an opinion, it can be a position if it's argumentative, but it's something that's going to require support. So that thesis statement is the second and most important part of your introduction. It allows you to tell your reader what you're going to say. Everything in this paper, though, has to relate to the thesis statement. So no matter what it is, a topic sentence or supportive statements or your conclusion, anything that you have in the paper has to relate. Otherwise, your readers get confused. And to tell you the truth, readers are kind of lazy. We get confused a little bit easy. So you want to make sure that your thesis statement is really clear. Now, as we talk about a thesis statement for a writer first, this provides the structure for you as a writer to make sure that you know where you're going. So what fits in in the paper? This goes back to your organization and your brainstorming. And what is it that you really want to say? Now, as a reader, it gives some expectations. So as I'm reading a thesis statement, I know what is coming. It's just enough of a hint. Now, there's a couple different types of thesis statements. So one is an explicit thesis statement. Explicit means that you are telling your reader exactly what you're talking about. So the subject would be preventing juvenile crime, for example. And one thesis statement can be juvenile delinquency can be prevented by active learning programs, full-time sports, and direct intervention. So it gives your reader a list of things to expect. So in this essay, I know that I'm going to learn about these different ideas. That's an explicit thesis statement. Another type of thesis statement is the implicit thesis statement where you imply. That's what implicit is about. You're just kind of hinting at what it is that you're going to talk about, kind of giving an idea, but not too many details. So if the subject is the federal aid to college students, which is something that's all important to all of us, then a thesis statement might be, the United States should provide a tuition grant to any college student who qualifies academically. So you have an idea of talking about financial aid, but we're not giving the explicit ideas like one, two, three, four. The thing is, is that a thesis statement needs to be interesting as well. So if the hook gets your attention, the thesis statement is going to direct the attention of your reader 
to the specific information you're about to say. That's really important. But again, it's got to be clear. It's got to be understandable. If not, your reader gets confused. Now, as we go into the body, these are really important ideas because this is how we develop the ideas of our thesis statement. So as we go through, each body paragraph has certain requirements. For example, one idea per paragraph only. It doesn't matter how many paragraphs you have. You could have five paragraphs or 20 paragraphs, but each paragraph needs to develop only one main idea. You can have short paragraphs and long paragraphs and medium paragraphs, but it still only talks about one thing. Even though that we are having supportive statements and descriptive statements and all those things, the main idea has to be singular. Another thing is that it begins with a topic sentence. It's kind of like a little mini thesis statement. A topic sentence is the first para or the first sentence in the paragraph and it directs the attention to the main idea in that paragraph. It's really important. It's usually the strongest sentence in each paragraph. One way to look at your topic sentences is make sure that they're really good is ask yourself does it answer? Does it have an answer in the paragraph? If you turn it into a question, then you can see if the supportive statements actually answer that question. If it does, you've got a great topic sentence. So ways to develop your paragraphs. As we talk through a lot of these ideas this semester, then you'll understand a little bit further, but you might use quotations or word for word what an author has to say if you're using a source. You might paraphrase somebody that's putting something in your own words. You might cite facts, you might use explanations and descriptions. There's a lot of details that you can talk about depending on your idea and the, the thesis that you're doing. The type of paper is going to determine what kind of development that you need. So if your professor ever says you need to develop further, then look at the type of assignment and go from there. Now, regardless, you want to have evidence. You want to have your paragraphs to be fully developed. So when you look at your topic sentence, if you have a great one, then look for those answers in that paragraph. Provide your reader with those answers and you have ways to develop. Now, we also transition between our paragraphs and there's different ways to do that in academics. We might look at different words or phrases. So first, second, third, those are okay if we're doing steps. Let's not use firstly, secondly, thirdly, fourthly. That gets kind of, well, it gets kind of boring and it really becomes kind of confusing and cliched. We might use in, in addition or in summary. Uh, for a conclusion, we might say in conclusion. But there are other ways that we can transition. Usually if we can transition the last sentence of a paragraph into the first sentence of the next paragraph, you have a great transition. What this does is allow your reader to just go from one idea to the next. It allows our reader to understand and say, okay, I've finished one idea and now I'm moving on to the next step. That's that next paragraph. So as we get to the conclusion, no matter how many paragraphs we have, eventually we got to wrap it up. So think of it like a package. So we summarize the main idea and give an overall perspective. This is that lasting impression of your paper. Your reader's not going to remember all of those details, but we will remember a good conclusion. If you don't have a good conclusion though, your reader becomes dissatisfied. And you can't just say, okay, I'm done. So you got to partially restate the thesis without saying the exact same words. So use different language in the thesis statement than in the conclusion. You got to make sure that you're handling this start with care. Now, a good conclusion is going to finalize the paper. Think of the lasting impression or what lesson do you have for your reader that takeaway that your reader needs to remember and you want to close the loop. So if the thesis statement starts the story and your topic sentences continue each step of the story with the development in your paragraphs, then where do you end up? How do you end the story? And that's your conclusion. Close the loop on the thesis statement. The next part is really satisfying that reader. If the reader sees your conclusion and you have said everything that you've already said, then all I have to do as a reader is just read your conclusion, forget your paper. 
But if you kind of just give that lasting impression, sum everything up beautifully, then your reader feels satisfied, not as if they wasted their life. So make something memorable. What is the takeaway that your reader needs to remember? And then conclude your paper. Now, in academic papers, when we have to document our papers, not necessarily in Comp 1, but especially in Comp 2, we're talking about research here, then we might have a reference page. So we use reference pages to tell our readers where we got our stuff. And pretty much any time that we borrow anything from a source, an idea or a quotation, we paraphrase, anything that we specifically borrow, we have to make sure that we cite it and reference it in our text. So we have certain formats in academics and for comp one and comp two, we use MLA format and APA format. Each of these styles require in-text citations. So what it does is signal to your reader that you're using some kind of material from a source. It also refers your reader to that reference page that has all the publication information. So say I really like a quote in your paper and I want to know more. I can go to your reference paper and, or excuse me, your reference page and make sure that I can find the source that you used. Then I can go find more. As researchers, especially when you get into Comp 2, this is going to be really important. You can find more sources by looking at what other people have used to source their paper. Now, it requires specific information, and that is determined by the format that we use. So, for instance, we, I said we use APA format, but that's the American Psychological Association. So, those are psychology, some of the social sciences, mass comm, business, those kind of uh, fields, they use APA format. MLA format is something you might be familiar with. Many high schools will teach MLA format, and that's a modern language association. So that is like English majors and some of the social sciences. There are other formats that, like Chicago Manual and all these others, but these are the ones that we teach at Carl Albert for Comp 1 and Comp 2. Most students are going to use one or the other. So let's go back into the stages of the, the actual writing process itself. We've already talked about the brainstorming and the organization, moving from the general ideas to an organized form. So now we have to move from the organization, the outline, to our paragraphs, our sentences and our paragraphs, and that's called a rough draft. Our rough draft is the first time we actually write something down, and sometimes we get a little stressed about it. But here's the thing, rough drafts are supposed to be pretty ugly. There's no perfection required in a rough draft. This is the first time, especially our first one, where you're just getting things down. Give yourself permission to kind of write something crappy if you need to. This allows you to just write your ideas. The thing is, is that a lot of times students will think, oh, I'm a bad writer or I just can't do this. And then they, they just kind of stop themselves from doing it. And sometimes you just gotta have the guts to write something, even if it is bad. I can help you fix something that's bad. If you don't give me anything to start with, then I can't help at all. So let's just try. Now, remember the purpose of a rough draft is to learn how to make it pretty. Remember, it's called a rough draft for a reason. So as we look at it, this goes into the recursive part of the writing process. So each paper, each rough draft should be bigger, should be better, should be more clear, less errors, less anything that, that is distracting from your reader. Each rough draft is going to get better. And as you kind of solidify your writing process, you get more comfortable in it. Each rough draft is going to be easier just to get started and finish. And as we go through the semester, I'm going to show you how to do that. But eventually, you're going to have to find a final draft. We can't do that unless we revise and edit. So that means you might go between the rough draft to the final draft several different ideas in, in several different ways, kind of going back and forth. So this is that recursive part that we got to talk about, the revision and editing. You want to make sure that you have multiple drafts. 
This is not where you turn in your paper the day it's due because you wrote it at three o'clock that morning. This means you've taken the time, days or even weeks in advance, taken the time to write multiple drafts. Each draft, again, is going to be better. But the trick is to have eyes on your paper. Get the feedback. Make sure that other people see your stuff. It's not about being perfect here. It is just getting what's in your head on the paper so a reader can understand it. And that is something that you got to make sure you do. And college, this isn't just where you can turn in a paper and say, I turned it in, now give me a grade. If it's not good enough, your teacher doesn't necessarily have to grade it. It can be handed back in a heartbeat. So you want to make sure that you do it right. That being said, I need you to take a note. I'm not going to accept any final draft until I see at least one rough draft. So if we are required to do two rough drafts in a paper, then I need to see the two rough drafts. I'm not going to do a final draft until I see those rough drafts. The reason is because I want you to have a good quality paper. Grading a, a paper as a final draft when it's pretty ugly, that's never good for anyone involved. So let's make sure that we take that time to really revise and edit and get the feedback that you need, make the corrections, so that way when we get to a final draft, you have something really to be proud of. So that final draft is really the protected, the, the perfected one, and, and this allows us to submit it for grading. It doesn't matter how many drafts you've done, whether it's two or 10. If you've done it and you've done a really good job, it's worth the effort to make sure you do it right. This is how I want you to feel like a superhero as you go through your paper, to finish it off and be proud of something that you have turned in for a final draft. Make sure you do it right. So I know that there's probably a lot of questions or concerns. It can be really scary to write a paper but don't make it so scary that you can't do it. Let me help you. Let us help you. We have tutoring available. We have other people one-on-one -on -one instruction and other things like that. But your professor is always the first, all, or kind of the first route to be able to get some help. So this is my contact information. I'm in Ollie Center, room 1307. Uh, it's in a suite, 1302. I'm uh, right next to the elevator. My phone number and my email addresses are here. That is my cell number. Uh, the 803 is a South Carolina number, but don't worry about that. Um, make sure that you contact me. Don't wait. If you have any questions, let me know. Thank you so much.